that one of your paintings behind you? It is. Um, there. It's a recent painting. It's a landscape of the West. Yeah, that's different. Uh, by the way, I have Mark Bowles on today on the Art Dealer Diaries, and we're doing this by Zoom, and he's at his house, and he's got this really cool painting. It's a little different than what you've done in the past. For those who are not watching this on YouTube, which I recommend that you do if you want to see what the painting looks like, is uh, the clouds are really a, a different and a lot more colors, yeah. just formation. I, yeah. Well, I think it's about um, morphing from one series to an X series. So you can look at the progression of my work over time and you can yes. see how I got to this point. So, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's the sky's atmospheric. That's how I look at it. I look at it as a way to tell temperature mm. by color and then a separation, almost like the impressionists did, but a different way of looking at the sky and, uh, and changing up the, uh, the molecules of the sky or putting different colors in. So in an impressionist way, but not at all like what we've seen. Mm. So it's a, a mingle of colors or intertwining of colors that make the sky. Mm. And hopefully that suggests um, atmosphere, temperature. Wait, so when did you start going in this, in this uh, series, so to speak? Probably three or four years. You have a couple small ones that were just with different blues in the sky, yeah. light and dark. And it's worked from that. And then all of a sudden it kind of ramped up into more colors. I used to do a lot of just, huge red skies yeah i know i love those though yeah i, I but i did enough to uh, satisfy me right <laughs> so you it. move on yeah right um, yeah and and the process of painting really is about learning all the time so you you just keep that carrot in front of you that you are going to pick up something new or a new way to say something that's kind of my objective that i i look for um and still be able to make a strong painting and and translate it and be relatable Mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the reasons I paint landscapes is that connecting memory we all have, and that's that we all have grown up in a landscape and seen a landscape. So there's a common bond in us that uh, is relatable. And so I think you kind of connect in my painting. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, you, when I see your paintings, personally, especially the colors of the orange and the, the blues, I always think of the desert. Yeah. Um, but you didn't grow up in the desert. You grew up in San Francisco, right? Well, out of San Francisco in Orinda. So it's yeah. 20 minutes out. Yeah. Um, but basically the Bay Area, which is, you know, a huge art scene. I went to college there, the California College of Arts and Crafts. And then I was going to go into Berkeley uh, for my master's. And Arts and Crafts offered me to get the whole scholarship package if I stayed with them. So I did that. Well, we're going to go um, back to that in a little more detail because I'm going to hit you on the whole thing. But when okay. you, but you, you know, you, you paint these um, desert scenes that do you do, mm -hmm. the, do you do California, Northern California? Kind you know, of? I, yeah, I did for years and years. I mean, even started with cows in the field and then, yeah. and I always flip flop back and forth between real abstract work uh, and experimental work using textures and cement and gravel and coffee grounds, all that kind of thing to put a different texture on the canvas. There's an artist in the Bay Area called Lundy Segrist and his son, mm -hmm. Louis Segrist, that were really masters of this. So when I first saw how they were translating a landscape with texture and real subtle colors, um, I hadn't seen anything like that. And so I, I really wanted to experiment with different chemicals and stuff, which probably wasn't the safest, but a lot of stuff that I did as a kid wasn't the safest. Um, so, so what, oh, so I did, yeah. So for a long time, as a family, we only saw the West Coast. So we would go from Oregon down to Mexico, just on the West Coast. They didn't travel East. And um, I'm not sure why now, but like my mom and dad never saw the Grand Canyon. Um, that kind of shocked me because um, I've been all over the West. But I think when I first started seeing Arizona and New Mexico and Chaco Canyon and, and places that are just iconic Monument Valley. Um, it changed my whole way of thinking. And it was probably at a good time uh, because I'd, I'd done my fill of California landscapes in more of a representational manner. Never really realistic. That was never my goal in anything is to replicate something. It, it was always to make a take on it. Mm -hmm. uh, put your own your own person into how you do it, make your own individual story or statement or um, your own voice. Yeah. So when you're growing up in Arenda, yeah. you, you, what do your mom and dad do? 
my dad was self-employed as a court reporter. So he had an office, about 15 employees, and they basically did legal depositions all day long. They didn't work in a court. Um, so he had, um, so he went to work at 4.30 in the morning, came home at eight at night. Um, when he got home, then we would have to all be silent because he had been listening to people talk all day and he just wanted it quiet. But he then would hand that it had off. To, that had to be hard though, right? I mean, that's, it's your father hard. come home and you're, you're, don't talk to your dad. No, I was pretty terrified of him or I was terrified of him yeah. um, my whole life. So, I, and looking at other people's stories that are an artist, that's not all that uncommon that you end up in your room alone drawing or playing music, uh, but we couldn't have the radio on. So, I mean, he was a bully and it, back in the day, so this is the fifties, that was allowed, I think, certainly much more than now. Um, and I remember we went on a camping trip. Um, so it was like eight hours up to Reading and over to the coast. Um, and as soon as they got in the car, they said, okay, we're going to have a silence till we get there. Come on. And then we, yeah. And then we realized we forgot our fishing poles. So we said, we got to go back. This is like, you know, a block from the house. They said no. And they kept going. So that was our, our fishing trip was no fishing poles. That had to be hard on your mother as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he was a bully. Yeah. yeah. So, and um, heavy drinker, alcoholic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, with all the different things that happened, he basically drank himself to death when he was 52. So it wasn't, it wasn't easy, but you know, a lot of people don't have it easy. It's how I look at it. So you kind of think that affected your the way you interpret art and see art because it has to have had a major yeah. into you. Um, you know, I, I think because of the experience, I just, I'm also dyslexic. Yeah. So going to school at times was a nice thing to do, get a getaway from the house. Um, and so um, there would be drawing at home and then you go to school. I couldn't uh, read well. I still don't read well because when you're dyslexic, it flies all over the page or you make words into other words and right. it's very hard. So, um, you know, you kind of get pegged that you're a slow learner or, right. and it wrecks your self-esteem. Yes. So, and I knew I wasn't dumb. Um, I knew I wanted more than that. I didn't want to be pegged as that. So I just kept putting more and more energy into artwork because that's where I knew I could excel at. So, um, were you getting kind of, recognized in like middle school and yeah. by your art teachers? Yeah. Yeah. So there was some of that, which helped an awful lot. And you won any prizes or any awards you um, as a kid? Probably in high school. I was, um, I was in a show down in Orinda and it was picked up by, you know, a local newspaper and it was an article written about me and what I do. And my mom was an artist, so um, she had a lot of connections. So yeah, I did. And I started selling kind of early. Um, I had a gallery in Belvedere that represented me. So in high school? Was, um, it was probably right around high school, high school into college. So and you I were really came, succeeding already really early on. Yeah, I, I understood what art could do, I think. Um, yeah, because it was incredibly important to me. So um, there's huge power in art um, and there's huge um, comfort in it. So um, it was just, a, yeah, it was a huge role that it played. So, yeah, so I did... Um, and then in college, I excelled um, to the point of really just having independent study when I was going to school. Um, so the class and the teacher would come to my studio. I had a studio in Emeryville. And I would talk about theories about what I was doing. Um, it had to do with time. A lot of it had to do with time, verbiage. Um, so it was just really exploratory. And at that time, that's what I wanted the art to be for me. Yeah. And did your, your mom probably was supportive if she was an artist? Yeah. Like yeah. You did. Very know. supportive. Um, so she was an illustrator at the beginning before she got married. That's what she was doing for a career. And then once she got married, that stopped and four kids she had. Mm. And, but during the whole. Did you period, fall in that group of kids. I was the third. So you're a male. Um, yeah. And then there were, we were three years apart. And then the story goes, my mom wanted another kid. My dad didn't. 10 years later, she had another kid. 
and that was what she wanted. So it was that kind of a um, marriage of, of, I don't want to say deceit, that wouldn't be right, but it was that kind of a marriage that you kind of got what you wanted out of it, I suppose. Um, so um, what were we yeah. talking about? Or did the other kids, did they end up going into any of the creative fields, your brothers or sisters? Um, well, I have one brother that did a little bit. Um, my oldest brother didn't. He was really into sports. Um, so he was kind of my dad's favorite. Yeah. And he passed away when he was 27. Um, my next oldest, he does some crafts, things like that. My youngest brother wasn't involved at all. Um, that much in art. He just uh, he did drawing like we all do in high school, but that was about it. He he's was the one that's far, He's far apart in age. That's the one that's far apart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's he was ten years older. He's passed away too. Yeah, um, tough too. Yeah, he's yeah. the one. I don't know if I told you has a had a AVM arterial venous malformation in the brain and had aneurysm. So there were, when he was thirty and just had a baby, um, he had this uh, bleed. And it was like two weeks in different hospitals trying to get him the best care. And finally, we ended up at UC San Francisco, the Dr. Wilson, and he did two back-to-back -back, uh, clippings, uh, aneurysm clippings uh, mm -hmm. in his head. And the recovery on that was, um, well, it was never complete, you could say. It never was the same. But he, he was in rehab for six months, learning how to eat, to uh, talk, mm -hmm. to walk, all of that, starting from the beginning, nursing. Um, was the first thing uh, you in your brain rewires itself back to what you can do. So he was there six months and then he was getting kicked out, but he wasn't fully uh, hadn't completed his his uh, recovery. So uh, my wife and I took him into our house and I quit painting and I just um, took care of him with different therapists that came to the house and walking every day and all the daily essentials, things that you have to do. Um, and he was there for about a year. And then I said I had to hand him back to my mom. And, and she took him at that time. She could take care of him. Mm. Yeah. But so it what's, was, that, you know, what's that like to quit creating for a year? I mean, I mean, that's who you are. That's what you do. You, mm -hmm. I mean, you get more than just money from it. You get yeah. self-fulfillment of uh, as a being a human and what your worth is. That, that had yeah. to be incredibly difficult, I would think. Well, I think this... Uh, his medical need was so bizarre and trying to figure it out with doctors because it wasn't diagnosed correctly for a couple of weeks and just the immediacy of it. And um, it wasn't long after this happened that his um, wife decided that she needed to not do this and divorce. And I was the only one that's going to step up and protect his interests against her and her family. Mm. Um, so it was kind of growing up quick in that area. I mean, I just, I had to be like a parent to him. And how, I just. How old were you at that time? Uh, he was 30. So I was 40. Yeah, you're 40. Yeah. Um, it, it was just too important to, to turn my back or say, I just can't do it. I didn't have a choice. No one else was stepping up. Somebody had to. Yeah. Or he'd been housed. I didn't want him housed. Um, he lived. Uh, so he lived down in the desert with my mom down by uh, Palm Springs. She moved from Miranda when she took him in and decided it was time for her to retire. And she always wanted to live in the heat. So she moved back down there, moved back down there. Um, and so uh, she passed away um, from heart issues um, there in her bed, very happy. And he was still living there. And then about a year later, he passed away, mm. um, which is a pretty common story of codependent people or dependent people, you know, on each other. Kind of right. Married. Yeah. Yeah. So you get, so when you go to, well, transition, it's hard to actually transition from that. I mean, it's painful even for me to hear. Um, when you go to, you get into a really great college, uh, yeah. college and you're what, like 18 or so? 18, 19. Yeah. I went right from high school there. And I was there five years, six years together, all together. Um, I took some time off and went down to San Miguel de Allende. I always wanted to go to Mexico mm -hmm. and study. And I wasn't there that long. Um, but, you know, at that age, 
um, you don't really think of the big picture yet. So right. I flew down to Mexico City, took a bus up to, well, up to San Miguel de Allende. So that was like an hour and a half, two hours. And, um, you know, all the stuff I'd read about the school, Instituto Allende, said Spanish speaking only. Well, I'd been in and out of Mexico a lot with my family and, and it never presented a problem before. But that was all very simple, um, you know, buying food, buying gas and all that. This was lessons in Spanish. And like the first day, I thought, oh, my God, no. I had no clue what they were talking about. Uh -huh. um, and I had rented an apartment and all that stuff. Um, so I spent just really a couple of weeks. And then it just was too much. I just decided this isn't I'm not learning or going anywhere. And, and I'm pretty shy or was. I don't know if I'm still shy, but uh, it wasn't easy to meet people there either. And it was full of a lot of Americans, kids and and stuff, but it just didn't happen for me. So I came back and re-enrolled back into arts and crafts. Yeah, with trying to get a degree in fine art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you did, right? What year was this that you were at in this? When did you graduate from high school? Uh, 72, so 76, 77. 76, okay. I guess I graduated. So you're just also involved in the tail end of the Vietnam War as well. Yeah. You had um, to, yeah. to register, you had to do the pull the number thing. I lucked out with the lottery. Yeah. yeah. What was your number? I don't even remember. It was just, thank God, like yeah. 280, 300. That was super high and it was tailing in. Yeah. But that had to be stressful for you. Um, that fear. That yeah. fear. Now, did you go to Vietnam? No, I'm, I was, am I, I didn't do that. I was a military doctor, but I didn't, I was before my time. It was my, oh, okay. brother's, my brother's time. So I went through it like it was me, but through, sure. through his eyes. Yeah. And, um, but so your, yeah, your experience of that with the fear, um, yeah. and you know, you're still, you're just now going to college, I guess, at that time. So you yeah. would get a deferment, but yeah, all your, your friends and people you knew were going for sure. Well, the, there was three brothers right in a row or three years apart. So we all interfaced with the Vietnam war. It was oh, that yeah. long. So it was always a topic at the house. Yeah. on what to do. And my parents had planned on supporting us in Canada yeah. if it came to that. Um, and we all lucked out. None of my brothers went. Um, and I think just two of us had the lottery. My oldest brother, I don't know, maybe he got a medical deferment. You know, I don't even remember at that time. Um, but nobody went. Um, we had somebody that was living with us, with my older brother at the time. Of the, they were in high school at that time, and he got drafted. Um, he was living because his family wasn't appreciative of his behavior. Um, so he needed a place to live while he finished high school. So my parents said, yeah, you can live with us. Um, so they did that kind of thing. They were generous in that manner. Um, but I remember we were writing him and sending him cookies and stuff like that and get letters back. And um, I can't imagine still to be taken away at 18. I could understand why 18 because they can train you to do anything they want. I think I, they would have not good luck with me now, but <laughs> to be able to move from your home to a different country and fight in a war um, for me seems unbelievable. I bet it seems unbelievable to anybody, but it happens. Yeah. Yeah. So you had that layered on your whole childhood when all your brothers are going through it and you, yeah. and you see you coming through it, coming up your points coming up as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you yeah. don't know what you're going to do. I knew I didn't want to go, obviously. I don't think anybody, well, there is people that want to go. Yeah. Um, oh, well. We were a very liberal uh, Democratic family. My parents were in probably a Republican area, a neighborhood. So there was lots of dinner parties. I remember just outrageous fighting amongst our discussions and arguments about the Vietnam War. Um, yeah, and, I remember all that stuff. Do you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a point of, uh, I think, of trauma for a lot of people. Yeah. Of, of our age and, and older. Yeah. What and we, we live by people's whether, part. I'm yeah, sorry. Whether to go or not to go and, yeah. you know, and all that, all those components, you know, and what your parents think of it or not think of it, you know, are they going to support yeah. you or not going to support you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But those things have real consequences, I think in the long term, uh, yeah. and probably still all that stuff still probably affects your art in some way or another. I don't know. No. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know either how to put specifics on it, but sir, it, it made me what what insecurities and all of that that I have, 
um, those are tender spots or points, I guess that you would say. Yeah. Um, in my personality. Yeah. Because um, there's still, I'm, I'm still talking about them today. There's a lot of stuff that comes up all the time that. Sure. Um, I don't know if it's a, I didn't deal with, but it's still present. I think a lot of people just don't talk about it. My father-in-law went through World War II and he only had uh, good stories about the war or good stories that he had time with people and what they did and all that. That was a big topic of what he talked about. But at night, he would have terror nightmares all night long, you know, kicking and hitting all that. And uh, he would say, no, no, I didn't. But uh, it affected him. And yeah, it's PTSD. Yeah. And he was a, a logger up in Oregon in the hills. Is, you know, um, it was a big change to hit World War II. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. every, or a lot. Yeah. And so when you uh, get through with uh, your the school in California, yeah, what's your what's your plan? I mean, now you have a you have a fine arts degree from a very good school, mm -hmm. and um, you know what's your plan to to make a living? Well, it, would, it was well, it's going to be fine art one way or the other. So right at the right at the end, probably the last year of working on my uh, bachelor's. I was um, asked to either go work or had an opportunity to go work at the Oakland Museum or the Richmond Arts Center mm. um, as a uh, an aide. Well, I can't think of the word. Um, Some kind of associate curator kind of thing. Yeah, to learn the business to see if that's what I wanted to do. Right. Um, and then and then here comes tragedy again. Um, so right in the same period, my oldest brother passed away. Um, so he was in a car accident one night. And um, that spun the dynamics of the family into a different loop altogether. Yeah. Um, so. And he's young. He's 27. Yeah. Yeah. 27. Stephen worked for the railroad right then. I still have his key to switch his switchman's key. Yeah, nice. Um, he was a good kid. I think he was having a hard time finding himself, which we all do at that age, you know. Um, so there's pressure on him. But anyway, he, he passed away. And then um, it, that was then my father's um, sit down and drink. Yeah. Um, he, he didn't want to deal with it. My mom, she went to her room for about a year. Yeah. Just cried. So um, one of the, the keen senses you get when you have parents of an alcoholic is you can sense a room real quick and you can uh, size up people real quick if they're friend or foe. Mm -hmm. um, so, so coming home from school, I knew if it was going to be okay if the table was set. That means we had some sobriety. It was normal. Um, if you come home and the house was just like it was when you left, then you realize there was, you know, you're gonna, you have to be careful. Get to your room. Shut the door. Yeah. So, yeah. And so you had to go through this again. You've got your degree. You're yeah. working at this as a curator, <clears throat> and then your brother passes, yeah. and then the you know the whole the family dynamic spiral down. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then my dad, um, so at the end, it took about a year and a half to, to die, yeah. um, even though that whole last five years was pretty crazy, I guess, it seemed like that they're not adding up time-wise, but that's what it felt like five years in the year. Yeah. Uh, um, so he, at the end, would only respond to pain for like six months. That's how bad it gets. Um, so I had to go to court and become his guardian. Mm. So I'm 20, what, seven now, maybe, yeah. or yeah. So, so in the process of that, and what they were trying to do was um he's self-employed, so we had a company and they were trying to help my mom because she wasn't working at the time. Um, never had really. She was a stay-at-home mom. So she needed to uh figure out money real quick. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was going to court to to um become his guardian and then i realized if i if it switched over to me as his garden guardian guardian then i would have to do the divorce and if doing the divorce then there was two brothers three brothers there was a chance that somebody would stand up and want to go after part of her inheritance of the house mm. so anyway i just froze to the divorce proceedings right there and we just watched it play out but I'll do, doing all that, that's daily contact with lawyers or his company and his office, um, the people that em, are employed by him, not knowing. Outstanding billing for two years with attorney's offices, trying to figure that out was a mess. Um, 
But again, I felt it was my need to, or my duty to step up and try to figure it out and help my mom and my brother. Because were, you know, were you able to <clears throat> do work as an artist during that time frame? Um, not much. And I think at some point, artwork and art school became esoteric to me. It just seemed so um, unreal. It was just like not what I was living in. So I guess it didn't feel like I could create at all because I just really disliked the fact that I had gotten my degree. Now, there's no sense for that, but I did. Um, so um, wouldn't go to the campus. I wouldn't go buy it. I just, I wanted nothing to do with arts and crafts. Now I'm incredibly thankful that I did do all that. Mm -hmm. It gave me a different uh, skill set as far as learning and, and what art can be and all that. There's still no teachers that I know I've reconnected with and I know them now. Yeah. And that's really fortunate. But for some period I didn't and I moved away trying to find what I could do else besides painting because I wasn't selling that much. Then it kind of dipped down and it wasn't they weren't very powerful paintings. Um, they were really just being done to make some money and it, that doesn't work. It never has. It never will. So, um, so I left and came back and I met my wife, um, and followed her up to Oregon for a year. And then, um, we decided to, um, I wanted to always go to Mexico and paint on the beach. To me, that just seemed perfect. <laughs> yeah. That's um, not good. <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, you know, just being very naive, I didn't realize all the <laughs> dynamics. Yeah. So we went down for months. And uh, finally ran out of money and came back to Palm Springs. And we stayed there for six or eight. No, it was over a year. We stayed there, decided to get married. Um, and in that, um, in that talking about marriage and what we wanted, we wanted kids. And I said I was going to be an artist no matter what. I wasn't going to do anything else. Now, he certainly had lots of jobs when he first got married, um, like working um, for Kaiser Hospital, uh, working in restaurants, things like that when we had kids. But I knew my main goal was to be an artist. Mm. I thought I'd be successful doing it. I just, that's all I ever have wanted. And so she understood. And I said, we're probably going to be really poor because um, <laughs> the chance of making it in the art world is pretty slim. Yeah. And so she, she had wanted to work corporations. Um, her dad was a logger. Her mom didn't work. And that I that that thing over here that you want, the golden key or whatever you call it, the mm -hmm. pie in the sky, she really wanted to see about corporate and she wanted health care. Her dad never had any. So um, we both had that in common. We didn't have health care as kids. And it used to be, you know, you knew when you're you're taking money to go to the dentist, um, you know, that or you, you stalled on going to a doctor. You didn't go very often. Yeah. So so. Um, so she knew that was that was kind of the deal. I just said, I, I can't surprise you, but I'm not going to work. I'm going to paint. And so wanting kids, uh, we moved out of the Bay Area up to Sacramento. And um, I learned how to be a stay at home dad, which was challenging. I had two daughters. Um, probably the best thing I ever did uh, to understand what a parent is about or what it can be about. And, um I'm real glad we did it. And, it. and it turned out to be fine. She had her career at Intel. This was the final corporation she worked for. Nice. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's and a good one. It is a good one. Yeah. And before that was Anheuser-Busch, which I enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was three cases of beer and uh, lots of tickets. It was in market. So we got to go see the Stones and a lot of different groups and go behind the stage and meet them and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah. It was really fun. That was a great perk. That was the only perk we really had because we didn't have much money at all. Um, yeah, you're an artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it just um, it worked out. So then she worked and just retired. She retired five years ago. So I think she's getting. I mean, she's done a lot, but she's still getting her grounding or her feet in what she wants to do as far as retirement, because it just comes, hits you one day, and then you're just not going back to work. And right, she had a lot of stuff planned. You know, the photo albums. I think everybody does first when they retire, and she spent a long time on those and just just that stuff. But, you know, I can see that it's kind of worn out. She wants to do something else. It's, um, you only can do so many dishes and clean the house so many times. Right. So, yeah, but she uh, takes good care of me and I, hopefully I take good care of her. So it's, it's good. And so when you become this stay at home dad and you're yeah. raising your two daughters, what were you doing art wise? Were you, where were you selling your art at that point? 
I had a studio in um, the garage, right? Um, so I remember painting in there. And I don't think, I think I went into a real thing after, after school, uh, something against my own success. Yeah. And yeah, so I got really, um, I guess I lost my core or something. I was very afraid of taking my work and showing people, mm -hmm. very shy about it. I didn't mm -hmm. think it was any good. So that was quite a few years where just, I would keep painting, but not, uh, not promote it. Um, and so I think that was even true when I started showing you in a way. Yeah. Very shy. Yeah. And you came because it, you, our connection was through Gregory Condos. Yeah. Yeah. And Greg was the one who said, Oh, you should look at this guy's work. He's really good. That's um, they really are. Um, or uh, Gregory Pass, Monty's I just saw um, so generous and they were so helpful in promoting me even in our community, as well as, as talking to you about me. And um, um, I'm probably a little bit shy around you. You have something that reminds me of my father. Yeah. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. I'm <laughs> yeah, hear that. I'm sorry to say it, but I thought I'd tell you that. But yeah, um, I'll come across men that have something, and it's yeah. that fear of flight or whatever that is. And Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the first time I met you, you won't remember this, but you were in Santa Fe, off Canyon, down downhill, down the driveway, in a yes. front end of a store or mm -hmm. a group of stores. And I walked in, and I'm sure you just looked at me like, who's coming into my store? But it looked like, um, why is he in here shoplifting? And, I, and that was what <laughs> came off, because you gave me this look like, who are you? That's um, so funny. Yeah. So it's all how we interpret stuff, right? So I, I really interesting, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's that... Uh, it's that remembrance of uh, fear. Mm. Um, so I still get it. Um, I, I, I just identify it now. Yeah. You know, I, well, so you may trigger that you don't want to have failure, right? You don't want to be rejected. Mm -hmm. And here's a guy that me potentially could make a difference in your life. And they mm -hmm. don't want to reject you. Yeah. You no, know, and yeah. not like your work or not like you. Yeah. And maybe that's the reason that you know, you wouldn't get into my gallery or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, I could see that immediately going, okay, you know. Yeah, it's it's too big of a deal, right? Yeah. That's right. what, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, a lot of that. I've pretty much have gotten over, I mean, not you, obviously, I have gotten over that. <laughs> but um, that stage fright, too, of approaching galleries, and it doesn't, um, doesn't phase me anymore. Yeah, well, you're successful. You found your footing, your grounding. You yeah. probably dealt with some of your past issues and in, in ways. Yeah. And yeah. that and that makes you a stronger and healthier person, quite frankly. Yeah. It really built up to a really uh not a good spot. And I finally decided to go see a counselor because I couldn't unwind it. You yeah, know, of course I, you can. Yeah. No way. So probably four or five years with him. Yeah. Just on this because I just wasn't happy and I had everything that said I should be, mm -hmm. um, that I thought about. So we opened Pandora's box and spent a long time figuring out what, what it was. Yeah. And it, and it comes down to your childhood was a lot of it. Always does. It comes down to that. Yeah. yeah. And not to blame them. They were just doing the best they could do under the circumstances. And my God, my father had it worse. Um, That's usually what it is. Did he have a parent or parents that were abusive? They were his, my grandfather, his father was a sergeant in the Marines. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. And so, and even from, I mean, age of 10, his father took him to a bar and sat him up on the bar and, and started feeding him whiskey mm. um, as a companion to drink with and as a joke kind of thing, entertainment for the group. But um, yeah. he had it rough um, too. And the war he came back from, and that very first day he burnt his uh, military outfits and would never talk about the World War II. This was your father? My dad. My dad. So he was in World War II as well. Yeah. At the very tail end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but whatever happened, he wouldn't. But there was all sorts of stuff in the family. I just found out for 25 years, about 10 miles from our house. So there's a Rendon and Walnut Creek. There was a family picnic with a reunion of cousins and uncles we never went to. I never heard about it. So I was talking to a cousin just a couple of years ago. And he goes, we never understood why you guys never came. And I can't, and yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. He didn't want to face it either. Probably your father didn't. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, so, so tell me a little bit about that Gregory Condos connection, because of course I represented Greg for like 25 years plus. Yeah. Um, how did you guys meet? Well, so I didn't know who he was when I moved to Sacramento and we moved to Sacramento to have kids. We could afford the rent so we could start a family, basically. Right. Bay Area is just getting too much then, um, like $1,000 a month for a house was too much. Right. Um, so I, part of the process, if you want to get known in an art community, is you got to go to the art openings every time they have one. Right. And different ones and start meeting people and all that. That's just the, that's the business of it. Um, and I like art. So I, I wanted to know who was in the community. Um not to be friends with or to collect, but just to know who was who was the ones that really caught my eye and caught my heart and, and work that I could look at for a long time and not get bored and see it and study it. I guess studying art, when I can find a painting that I can study with somebody else's, mm. um, that's what uh, that's what engages me, and especially engages to buy. Um, so went to an art opening. I think I met Monty first. Um, and I showed Gregory a picture of one of my paintings, I think, and he critiqued it, of course. Yeah, that's he, would, that, he would do that. Yeah, he's a teacher. That's all he, you know, so, um, and and his comments were rightfully so. Things were out of perspective, and he could spot it immediately. I couldn't see it. Um, and and part of, part of that is because I don't draw or paint uh, plein air. I don't go out and paint. I'm a studio painter, so it's based a little bit more on concepts and theory, I think, than, than other artists say, um, it just being a studio painter, I find it much more comfortable. Um, it's quiet. Um, it can be very intense and, um, you can really, uh, work your brain as an exercise with your paintings. You can connect with your paintings, all of that. Um, outside to me, it's the wind and the cold and the sunlight blurring off a white canvas. It doesn't hit right. me. I've right. tried it. it. Just doesn't work. <laughs> um, where were we headed? I already forgot. Yeah, with Gregory Kondo. So he critiqued hmm. your work. Critiqued my work and talked to him a little bit. And I showed him a painting that ended up later ended up in the city of Fairfield at a show. And he goes, you know, you're pretty good. And um, Gregory didn't throw out compliments. He did not. He was no. very, he would really tell you exactly what he thought. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the reasons when he said, you really should look at this guy. He's really yeah. good. Yeah. I took it to heart. Like, okay, this is a man who knows art. And I know he doesn't give out compliments or does no, that kind of stuff. No, no. And th that day that I met you, I had like five more paintings that were the ones that I wanted to show you. Yeah. And he picked out three and, and I, we ran out of time and I, I wanted to say, wait, 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 I want to show you these. But <laughs> again, I was pretty insecure about it. Um, so I got to know Gregory and Monty from art openings and Monty, of course, is just a gem and uh, a character. And so, and very easy to talk to Gregory, of course, at the beginning started, he scared me a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I when I got to know him, he was a yeah. different person. Yeah. 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 He could be pretty rough on the outside. Um, but they were just the most incredible people to me and generous. Monty gave me his last drawing oh, nice. uh, that he did. And that means a whole lot to me. Um, and I was with him the last week that he passed away. And yeah. we used to visit a lot or call and talk and stuff. So, yeah. um, yeah, that friendship was was pretty grand. Yeah. So, yeah. So then I got to know everybody else in the area or not know them, but know who the players were in Sacramento. And then I finally, uh, it could have even been Monty that put me in contact with a gallery here in Sacramento. And they took me. He was just opening it, the gallery. And I was there probably for four or five years. Mm -hmm. And then we had a um, difference of opinion about, is it a salesman that actually sells art or is it the art that sells art? Hopefully it's and, the art. Yeah, I know. He disagreed. Uh, and, yeah, sure. so <laughs> I know. <laughs> so we parted, we parted ways. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then I showed in different uh, uh, places around town, different galleries. There was a lot more. Now there's not very many galleries here in Sacramento, unfortunately, but we just went through a, a pandemic. So it took a lot of businesses with it. Um, showed around here, Money and Greg would come to the openings. They went to openings all the time, their, mm -hmm. their whole life. I'm sure she still does. Um, and then at some point, um, 
I would show every year and we'd have good sales, but I knew I didn't want to be local, a local artist. I wanted to be more on a national level. Mm -hmm. So I kept trying for Santa Fe and that's a hard town to break in. It is. Um, yeah. So probably five different galleries um, and I exited different ways. Um, one time I had a shipper call me up and said, I have a bunch of your work here. I don't know what to do with. And I go, what, you know, what is this about? Well, apparently the woman that owned the gallery changed her mind and she went on vacation to Mexico for a couple months. And, um, she had somebody drop my work off at the gal at the shipper and he wanted to know where to ship it back to. That's how wow. I found out. Yeah. Wow. Um, and as you know, there's some that's devastating. I mean, that's just a devastating thing yeah. to have happen to you. It was shocking. Yeah, yeah. it really was. Um, oh, one time we went um, we went back to an opening of mine. It was going to be August, I think it was. It was all the artists there were going to go. And I had ship work in ahead of me. She already had some. So we walk in and, hi, I'm Mark, because I'd only met her once. And she goes, oh, I shipped all your work back. I didn't like it. And, and I was just shocked. And um, so we had rented a car. My wife was there. My kids were there. Oh, God. Yeah. So I, the only um, good part of the story is we were out in back of the gallery in the parking lot. And um, I was talking to Debbie and I said, I can't believe it. I mean, we just drove here. What, you know, what the hell is going on with this? I don't, I don't get it. But people, some gallery owners can be very abrupt like that. Anyway, the guy that owned the gallery, a doctor, happened to be walking by the car when, and I wasn't ranting. I was just saying, you know, fuck her, basically. Yeah. And he um, um, said, what's going on with, is it about this gallery? And I told him the whole story. And then she was gone in about two months and she'd been there for years, but it was so disrespectful and rude. Um, that one caught me more. And yeah, that's just uh, honestly pathetic. Yeah, and yeah, that's so, one of the worst stories I've actually ever heard. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And I mean, I know art gallerists can do just horrific things with artists, but that one's uh, mm -hmm. that one's got to go to the top of the heap on that one. Yeah, that was pretty yeah, crappy. Yeah. That's uh, not. A, but you, know, you have managed to get into Santa Fe and do exceptionally well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I gave up. I decided no, I'm not going to. Santa Fe is not for me. I had a lot going on in Palm Desert. I had your gallery. Um, I had San Francisco, I think, at that time. Yes. Um, and they just closed San Francisco. Um, but uh, so I got a phone call. It was from Nancy, who owns Canyon Road Contemporary Art in Santa Fe. Yep. So, so we talked. At first, I said, no, I'm not really interested, but thank you. And she goes, but I saw this ad, and I saw it six months ago you did this and this. And so I could tell that it wasn't just, you know, be in my gallery. Um, yeah. She was, she had a she was plane. doing the legwork. She yeah. Was interested. Yeah. Exactly. She knew who I was already before she called me. Yeah. So we talked about an hour and, and then I said, well, mail me a contract and I'll look at it. And I just didn't know. And I thought, well, again, what do I got to lose this time? <laughs> um, you know, so I uh, sent it there, sent my sent contract back. We talked about it, negotiated, and then we um, shipped work in. She was in a different spot than she is now. And um, she sold a painting right off the bat. And then um, she was selling work almost every day. Um, not of mine, but of the galleries. And she's a hustler in the most positive way I can say. Um, she knows how to run a gallery. It's her money. It's her business. And right. um, she's really good. She was in New York uh, working for a big company in marketing. I think it was... Um, I can't Pixar or something like that. She was doing things like that until 9-11. Yeah. And then she decided to reevaluate her life and she moved to Santa Fe um, and just did that. And she had a passion for art. She still does. She loves knowing artists and about them and their process. Yeah. That's all the right things. Yeah. yeah. So um, she moved to a bigger space, which I know must have been a big gamble for her and it worked. And so, yeah, she's been, She's my mainstay selling. She just does yeah. a tremendous job. Yeah, um, that's fantastic. Yeah. And you're in a bunch of uh, art museum collections as well, like the Booth and yeah. the Museum of Art, Denver Art Museum. Um, Crocker. Crocker, yeah. And, uh, down by you, Arizona. Is it 
or the Phoenix Museum. Yeah, the Phoenix Art Museum. And then the the college in Tucson, yes. your college. Yeah. Yes. The, yeah. yeah. That college has an amazing art collection, by the way. The University of Arizona Art Museum has, you know, they have a de Kooning, they have a Keefe, they have a Rothko, Rothko. They have Benton's. I mean, they have yeah. really an amazing collection. People don't realize how strong that art collection is, but it yeah. is. I heard about the Rothko. I'd heard yeah. about that. Um, yeah. I'll have to go look at it next time. I haven't been yeah. there yet. Yeah, they're doing a really good job and they're really pushing and working on that. But president of the university is really positive for uh, art. He understands the importance and what it can do okay. as well as photography. Yeah. Um, so they're really, uh, you know, they're, they're hitting on all cylinders, which is nice to see. Really nice. Yeah. I wish every school knew how important art is, especially yeah. our kids. Yeah. It's critical. Well, especially yeah. most, unfortunately, most artistic individuals are kind of thrown off to the side, right? Yeah. We embrace our athletes, but we don't really embrace our artists. Absolutely. And, um, you know, or, or we embrace the people that get all A's and are science-based, but, you know, yeah. individuals that, you know, can do something remarkable and change the world yeah. are often just, you know, left out to the, to the side. And, yeah. you know, you're, you yeah. were, I think you were fortunate in the sense that you, at least you had teachers and your mother who understood art and encouraged you, you yeah. know, because without that, who knows what you do? Right? Yeah, that's very true. Um, no, because that really was a way to express myself and vent myself um, through all of this. Um, and I think part of it, too, my dad was self-employed. So I saw that role model of self-employed and he wasn't lazy by any means. Um, when he worked, he worked hard and for long hours. Um, and I like the idea of being self-employed. Yes. Like work for enough people. If, if you can do it, I think it's great. Um, there's a lot of risk taking in it. I like that. Um, yeah, no, I was fortunate to be able to um, f find this and find a um, success in it. I used to go when my daughters were in school, they used to be the art docent. And then um, I would run sem or assemblies for the kids. These are elementary kids. Mm -hmm. So I would put together a group of artists. We'd go into the auditorium and set up our wares, so to speak. So um, I would paint there and talk about painting. And at first I'd give a little lecture about how important art is in our lives and that they're, once we're done, they can go around through every station and talk to different ceramicists or bronze people or painting. And so we had probably eight different artists. And what I talked about, even though it might have been a little bit above their heads, is that if you don't get understand math or you don't understand reading, there's always something you can find that will um, make you feel fulfilled. And for me, it was artwork because I don't read and I don't like math. I don't like any of that. I do read, but it's strained. Um, so you could tell some of the teachers thought, well, that's a nice, that's a great thought. And then other ones thought, don't tell them that you can get away without reading. You know, um, and then working with some of the teachers in school, um, they can't grade it. So they don't know what to do with art. Yeah. Um, yeah. They think it's just messy. Um, and that floored me to find an adult that didn't understand art, because to me, everybody I knew understood art, you know. So, yeah. And there's a big swath of the world that doesn't understand it, doesn't appreciate it. Um, part of it, a lot of it probably is exposure, quite frankly. Yeah. You know, they don't get exposed to it any, any time in their lives. Yeah, and, you know, but when you do find it and when you do get exposed, just like me, you yeah. know, I'm mean, science based and all this, you know, you know physician research. Yeah. And stuff, but when I really discover art, then it's like, oh, yeah. wow, where was this all my life? Yeah. You know, this is something completely different. And, you know, just working with artists who I can appreciate and understand and have a sense of copacetic with them. I mean, I think I relate better to artists than I do maybe any other kind of individuals, quite frankly. I do. Yeah. I lived with 50 at one point. That was 50 fun. 50 artists? 50 artists in a warehouse. Where was that? Emeryville. Yeah. Um, there was a, a lack of um, studio space at, in Oakland or Emeryville. And, you know, I lived on top of the uh, old building on the third floor at one point. Um, where I had a cot in a sleeping bag, I wasn't supposed to stay there at night, so I would do anyway, and yeah. um, that kind of stuff. That was fun. You're young enough to do it, you know, kind of thing. And, and then the 
there was a group of artists that realized if they got on the city council of Emeryville, they could change the laws that uh, pertain to their community, but pertain to live work spaces. Mm -hmm. So they did just that. And they took over one building and made it a co-op. Mm. Um, and then it spread throughout uh, blocks and blocks. So I was in a Shell Oil corporate building at one point, corporate mm -hmm. and warehouse. And you'd go in and you tape off like 2,000 square feet on the floor because it's all open space. And then you build that out. You build up the walls and you put in your own heating and bathrooms and all that. Mm. So that was about a year or two of doing that, which was, um, that was very fun. I mean, I look back at that really fondly. Yeah, I'm sure you learned things from it as well. Yeah, yeah. That you weren't in the same, you know, that you're not alone, quite frankly. That there's right. people in the same boat you are trying yeah. to survive and make it as an artist. And yeah. in fact, what would you tell artists? Because, you know, you've had a uh, a very hard road in a lot of ways, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you're academically trained. Yeah. What would you tell artists that are thinking about wanting to go into this profession? Well, you, you have to want it pretty much more than anything. I think, because you're gonna, it's going to be a long row, road. I think it's, um, if you can sustain yourself, it's, and if you, I mean, if it just pulls at you enough, then it's worth it. I mean, this is all I wanted. Um, all I wanted to do was paint. And I still feel that way. I could easily spend, well, not with my back and stuff, but eight hours. I used to spend eight to 12 hours a day painting. I'd rather paint every day. Now it's usually four or five hours, sometimes six. But um, I'd rather spend time doing that than going on vacation or going anywhere else. I, Debbie has to pull me out of here. <laughs> Last year was very busy. And so she wasn't too successful in pulling me out. But, and, and that caused problems because I'm not engaged. She's retired. She wants time with me. I want time with her. But I, with so many commissions and so many paintings to fill back up empty walls kind of thing. Right. I just painted, I mean, painted for, I've been painting now solid for two years, some little vacations in between, but I made a commitment that I would start taking more time off and um, do other stuff, go to San Francisco for the day. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. When you said that, do other stuff, I could see in your face is like, I'll do it, but I really want to be painting. <laughs> I do. Okay. I do. It's all I, I love painting. Um, you, you get, um, it could be like meditation, maybe not. You get in a wave or a, you get in the space with your canvas of um, immediacy. I paint acrylic, so it colors change and dry fast. Mm -hmm. um, a, a painting can be done in a couple of days. It can be done in a day. Um, but um, your learnings, it's not that you're just sitting there painting. Your, your brain is engaged with the canvas. There's a dialogue that goes on that I have no idea what it really means. I've never verbalized what I really am saying to myself when I'm talking, but it, it's kind of like, well, if this is here, this has to be here. This is missing here. And you're not, so I'm balancing my eye um, to make it move around the canvas, uh, make somebody else's eye, manipulate it. So it'll go around in a circle. So you, mm -hmm. you'll see all the canvas. So it's with the composition, um, things like that, balancing color. So that's what I do all day. So it's, it's, it's learning. And it's fun. And then when you think that you know it already, you know it that you're what you're going to do. Then you have to change it up. So then you have to bring in. I call them awkward colors. So I'll bring in a lime green um, just to see how that's going to interplay with all the other colors. Mm -hmm. Can I do it? What other colors have to change? So it's it's that kind of a dialogue all day. And is it um, is it is it becoming a life of its own? A good painting, I think has its own energy that'll hold up for a long time. If you get to know a painting really quick and memorize it, it's not engaging anymore. So you can kind of walk right by it in the wall and not even look at it anymore. Mm -hmm. I try not to do that. I try to make it uh, have a lifespan of its own. And, you know, you can come back to old paintings and sometimes see that they work still. And then every once in a while, you'll find a dud that you go, God, <laughs> I let that out. Um, I wish I hadn't have let it out of the studio, but that's it. But that's always the issue for an artist, you know, is when is it done? Is it good enough? Yeah. You know, am I happy enough to let it go? But also I, you know, it's a commerce thing too. You have to make money, you yeah. know, you get rid of a 40, 60 painting that you spent time on and yeah. you know, scrape it. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's always, a, I'm sure it's always a, mm -hmm. 
fine line, I'm sure. Yeah. I used to always uh, come in the first thing in the morning and look at a painting and you can spot right away what's wrong if there is something wrong. You had a chance to sleep and think about it too. I think yeah, that's part yeah. of it. And your yeah, and your eyes are reawake to something else, and then right. you see it again. You're not stuck in it. Um, that and there's a good trick to always look in a mirror. Yeah, back Ed at Mel does camp. that. But oh, does he? Yeah, that shows you your mistakes right away. Um, I don't have one here. I should get one because um, they it's just immediate help. But there's a certain presence a good piece of work will have, mm -hmm. and. Um, I think maybe because I spent my life looking at artwork, I can spot what it is. And usually I can explain it to Debbie or somebody else and go, this is why I think this adds up. But you can feel the the, the life in the canvas or the energy or whatever's being transmitted. And um, that's a good painting when it can capture you. When I'm in a museum show looking at people's work, you know, I can almost get my heart pounding and I can feel like I want my feet to run up and down in its place because I'm so excited because the artwork's so good. Um, and I usually want to immediately leave and go home and paint. I just, um, it, it, there's a rush that I get off of it, um, which is, um, it's probably addicting and that's probably why I do it. <laughs> well, I think there is some probably, I mean, it, you get serotonin and dopamine release for sure. You know, yeah. just like athletes do when they exercise yeah. and that's a joy, you know, hormone that makes you feel better. Yeah. And so, you know, anything that gives you joy to do, you want to do, right? That's true. Yeah. So I like it. Yeah. Clearly you get that. Um, and what projects are you working on? Anything big net right now you want to share with people? Um, I, I'm trying to catch up. It really has been like that for two years since the pandemic came. Yes. Um, it hit March and I think March and April, I was in seven galleries at that point. And everyone was kind of going, well, we don't know. We try to stay open. And nobody right. really knew if it was coming, if it was true, all of that. Right. Um, and then it was obvious that it was true and it was coming and it was out of our control. Yes. And there was not much sanity to, to grasp onto. And all the rules for galleries change back and forth, the being open, being closed, and um, still do change, I guess, with masks or not masks. Um, but so some of the galleries... Uh, the one in Santa Fe just um, nailed it. Um, she is, must have a great memory. She knew she knows everybody that has ever bought my painting or other artists' work. She knows who they are. She has their you know Rolodex or her emails. So she really reached out to people and said, "This isn't the time that we you know let our artists down. Mm -hmm. um, you're collecting them. They still need people to be collecting them so they can stay in business and." Um, and she remembered different paintings. You know, you like this painting when you were here. I'll send you a photograph again. So she really worked. Um, right. And it's good for the, you know, collectors too, because it makes them feel good, right? Not on many levels. One, just have new art in your home is yeah. very healing, I think. Yeah. You know, it gives you a, a new focal point to be, it's like a kid, you know, almost. Yeah. And also it's a, you know, the way she approached it is it's a way that, you know, you feel good about buying the art because you know you're helping the gallerist and the artist as well. Right. Yeah. It makes sense. And she and she gave some incentives. And yeah. that's normal at that time. But she uh I mean the first year, my understanding is she made more money than the prior year. Um, which is and and then you kind of look at your business plan and go, Well, do I need art openings? Do I need right this kind of advertising or is it really working now? But you know, I think everything is still in flux right now. Yeah, uh, it is. When, we're not done. So, yeah. So it's, but it's for me and I know a lot of artists didn't have an easy time at all, but part of me not wanting to be a local artist is really the fact there's people out there that are never touched by an economy. They have enough money. They always buy. Um, I wanted to be in that kind of uh, an area that would attract them, which is usually second and third homes. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of realities that you can't change, even if you don't agree with them or like them. Uh, people normally buy paintings to match their couch. I mean, I fought that for a hundred years, but it's not going to change. Um, and then if I look at myself, I go, I don't match the couch. The couch is white. So I, any painting will go with it. Um, but there's some principles that just aren't going to change. So I didn't want to be local. I wanted to be national. So I would have um, an opportunity to have my work in front of people that could afford it all the time. Um, yeah. I guess going through one of the recessions. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good, I think that's a good tidbit for artists that are out there, quite frankly, is mm -hmm. first of all, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, I see this 
I've seen some really disastrous results for artists who really just have one gallery. Yeah. Uh, because things happen, right? Things happen yeah. to the gallery. Things happen. And if you're depending on that as your main source, yeah. uh, for one, just for the money. And two, you're, I think you're really limiting yourself to the client base that you're going to get. Yeah. Even if you're selling all your work through one gallery and you're selling it all, you're still missing a lot of different people. You're only hitting yeah. that, that group of people that they know. And usually a lot of that's locally and regional, but you, yeah. know, you have no idea what you're going to miss if you, yeah. by being there. So I think it's, you know, a minimum of two or three galleries is important. If you can produce enough to do four or five, great. Yeah. And it gives you bigger spread. You just don't know. It opens your, your opportunities and yeah. that choose to, to just keep it to one gallery. Mm. Yeah. They're risking it all. It is. Um, and a lot of artists don't like marketing, um, but it's part of the business. If you want to be in part of the business, you have to learn kind of the rules about it. You yeah. don't burn bridges. Um, that took me a while to learn, but you don't burn bridges. And really, when it comes down to it, Monte Kondo has taught me about this. It's about relationships. It's the relationship with the owner of the gallery or the salespeople. Yes, um, it's about that period. It's not about money. I do really good without thinking about money. Um, it, it hit me once I was uh, in an art store buying paint and we didn't have a lot of money. And I went to buy red paint and it was really expensive. And I put it down and I thought, well, I'll just work around red, work around it and not have it. And <laughs> actually, most of my success has been with red paintings. It is. I love them. Those are my favorites. They're, they're, they were fun. <laughs> um, so I don't, um, I keep money out of the studio. I don't think about it. I don't think about it with, in regards to a painting. Um, once in a while, when it's a huge canvas and it's um, hard to do, because of just the physical size, it's kind of like, um, was, is this worth it? I'm taking this amount of time, usually. Uh, commissions are really hard because you spend about three times the amount of time mm. on one commission that I could I could have done three paintings. Right. Yeah, so, but there's, it's also, it's a different way of doing art. You collaborate a little bit with the people that are buying the work. And so you get to see inside their head on what they're thinking about your work and what, what their parameters are. And, Mm -hmm. um, it can get too much in my head sometimes and it becomes difficult but then usually I just have to talk to them again and say okay let, let's go over all this again and yeah I find commissions to be very difficult uh, mm -hmm. on many levels not, not only as a as a dealer to deal with it but as an artist and for the the client because in the client's head they have a certain image that they see often yeah. you yeah. know which is not realistic you no. know and then no. the artist has their uh, interpretation of what the, the client is saying and then the dealer has to you know be the go-between and what i've found and what i try to do when i when somebody will do a commission i usually try to dissuade them honestly but is to say listen you want the best work let the artist have free reign you can give them some mm -hmm. ideas some parameters but only in a gross way let's not have i need the rainbow the bird mm -hmm. the fence you know the yeah. mountains and the clouds yeah. I don't even want to go down that road. And I yeah. know the artist definitely doesn't want to go down there. No, because then you're just executing somebody else's idea. You're hamstringing uh, them, first of all. Yeah. You know, the artist. And uh, you just don't get, you don't get the best result. You, you no. Don't know. I think real, I, I do pick three to five of my paintings off my website. Tell me which ones you like the most. Yeah. And then let me be. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people can't let it be. Um, you know, a lot of the people that I deal with, um, you know, they're owners of companies and they're used to getting what they want. Right. And so they think they know what they want. And so they add in stuff. Um, and that's just them. You have to take that and go, well, they did hire you for you. So um, forget what they're telling you about their golf course or anything, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, but I think that one of the best ways, and um, I can't think of her name now, the only commission she would do is she would let you tell her the size of the canvas and if you wanted it warm or cold colors, mm -hmm. and that was it, nothing else. So she didn't have to change any growth that she was into, mm -hmm. that she could just, just that would be continue on. And then I talked to another artist because I, I am getting a commission from him. Um, he does drawings first and send them to you, and then you can execute them. He'll execute it that way, which is what I would hate, but he seems to be fine with it. Um, so I'm going to do that. 
Um, but they, they're tricky, but you know, it's, they're actually, it's a big part of my income. Yeah, no, I mean, for some artists, it really is. Um, yeah. I know which artists can do it and which artists can't do it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't try to push the, push the boundaries because it just turns out to be a disaster. Yeah. So, and yeah. I, I think if, if I give any advice to my listeners out there, if you want a commission, give them very little parameters, let the artists do what they need to do. You're going to get a better piece of work. I think. Sure. Absolutely. That's why you pick that artist. Trust yeah. him. Yeah. yeah. Trust them or, you know, to do what they do, you know, yeah. give them a size. You can do that. That's cool. Yeah. You no, know, you can give some, some, you know, gross parameters, but leave it at that. Yeah. And otherwise just don't go that route. Go find something you like, you know, yeah. that's already done. Exactly. And usually it is size. That's all I can think of what, you know, but then it starts, well, I like this part of this one and this one. Yeah. And this one. I hate that. I and just, then, I don't yeah. need that hassle. And I know my artists don't either. <laughs> no, because it, it really log jams you in a yeah. sense. Cause yeah, you're just executing and you're trying to make it work. You want them to be happy with it. You don't want to ever send a painting out and have a client not be happy. Right. And I think one of the reasons is because the first thing anybody else comes into their home, they're going to go, this was my horrible experience with this. Painter. Right. <laughs> you don't want that. You want to get referrals off of other work or, or just to make sure people are happy and, you yeah. know, work's not cheap and um, they need, they have the right to be happy with the work they get and collect. Yeah. Yeah. Up to a point they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? That's for the gallery is to do. Yeah. That's where, that's when you pay my, the big bucks is because <laughs> I, I have to deal with those issues and I, oh, I, I have my fair share of them. Yeah. Yeah. Better and you I, than me. Yeah. And as I get older, it's just like, no, nah, I don't really need that. So yeah, I don't care. And my artist doesn't need the hassle. Yeah. You know, and sometimes, quite frankly, you can sum up the person that w wants to get the commission and you know, just from talking to them that it's going to be unrealistic and impossible to please this person. Yeah. Uh, and you're just going to have trouble. Yep. Yeah. It's going to drag out. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, I think we covered some stuff. Anything else you want to talk no. about? Before we... No, that's, that was quick. Yeah. Don't even know how long it was. Let's see. Uh, about an hour. Okay. That's good. I don't know if I could talk for an hour. I guess I yeah. can. Yeah. No, you can talk for an hour. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. Well, well, I love your work. I've always loved your work. Thank um, you, Mark. It's interesting. Your paintings, I'll, I'll sometimes go by where your paintings are hang, hanging, and all of a sudden, I'll just stop, and I'll see something that he didn't see before. Oh, good. Good. You know? And I'll be like, damn, look at good. that. I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, and so that's, that tells me there's a lot there. There's a, there's a depth to your artwork that it can do that to me literally as I'm walking by. And that's happened on many occasions with your painting specifically. Great. I mean, that's what, I, that's what I aim for that. I, you know, even some of the work in my house, not a mine or mine too, I suppose. I mainly have other people's art in my house now, but if after a while I don't see it, I usually take it down and put something else up. It means I, I worn it out. Yep. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I have yeah. in my own collection, if there's something that I start to ignore yeah, and it doesn't have the same uh, resonance with me, then I'll, mm -hmm. I will de-access it from my collection and sell it. It doesn't happen very often, but it has, yeah. I've I had like, I'm not looking at this anymore. I'm not, yeah. why? well, then I need to let it go and I get something else. Cause I have plenty yeah. of things I do like to want to buy. And right. You know, I, it I, means, you know, the value of artwork. You know, it, it does take that that whole of you that it entertains you, it, it attracts you and all that. So when it's not there, it means it's just not working. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the pieces that are in my collection generally are really, I mean, they really grab me. I, I, I look at them constantly. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's the best. Yeah, that's yeah. the best way. I, I do not uh, buy for my couch. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> that's good yeah ever <laughs> no i buy because it has some kind of guttural response emotional response or something yeah. that just i get it and it's like oh my yeah that's that's it that's coming well, you, out. you have the eye you have a great eye for art you and do. as does my wife yeah, uh, yeah both, kathleen's sweet yeah She's she does she also has that ability to and we're you know our eyes have grown together Let's just put it that way. Oh, that's cool. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah. That's real sweet. Very good. All right. All right. It's so nice to get to talk to you, Mark. And, nice talking to you, Mark. Uh, you know, 
Next time you come in, I'll try to promise not to look at you while you're shoplifting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I'll do it. It's you funny you say store, something like that because I never look at anybody in that way, interestingly enough. I know it's my own insecurities, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm sure. I mean, the story has been told. I see it. I can see why. I can see yeah. why you would have those feelings, you know? Right. You don't want to be, um, you know, uh, the thought of, Trying to get into a gallery or be associated with a gallery you really want to be with, especially if Gregory Condis is associated with it. Yeah. No, you don't want rejection. That's a bad thing. Yeah. You know, it's a very devastating thing. It's very hard for artists and actors and actresses and things too, I think, just yeah. as well as that. You know, they're very good at what they do. You yeah. Know, they're competent and um, and they put in their whole life and effort. And then somebody to just go, eh. I know. You know, and let it roll off your back then. Well, it doesn't, you know, no, and, doesn't. Yeah. and you know what if, yeah. like that gallery and the artists that are in it. Yeah. You know, then it's really painful if, right. you, you know, if they don't want to have anything to do yeah. with you. And it could be so many different reasons. Um, so it doesn't many. have. Yeah. It's not because you're not good. Yeah. Um, and you can also I've taken a this last year. I ship paintings out of Park City to Santa Fe. They had been this, sitting in Park City for over a year. They sold immediately in Santa Fe. Yeah. So that's again back to your get more than one gallery because you just right. don't know where there's no uh, rhyme and reason really on why one sells over another. That's um, right. And if the gallerist may really, you know, find something about that painting that's very compelling, mm -hmm. you know, then it gets a whole new life. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. A, lot, so. a lot of involved. But yeah. So for me as an artist, I try not, I like marketing, but I don't go down that trail or that pathway too often to get too involved, especially with the galleries, because you guys know what you're doing or you should yeah, that's, be. Yeah, that's what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it works out all, all well, all good. Well, thank you again for taking the time. It's been too long. Yeah. Since we, I mean, we talk occasionally, but it's been too long since I've seen you. I think the last time I saw you actually may have been in uh, a museum in uh, LA. I think it was in LA. Palm, Sp Palm, Palm Springs. Springs. Yeah, Palm Springs. Yeah. It was we a great bumped, show. You know, we bumped in. Oh, God. That yeah. Was a, that was an amazing show. It blew me. It away. was. I don't remember the title, but it was Western yeah. Art. Yeah, it was um, Western Art of all types. Yeah. It was, yeah um, they've got a great collection. Yeah. Um, this was traveling, I think, but they, they got it a was. lot of beautiful baskets. Yeah. Yeah, that collection was out of um, one of the, the Wyoming museums or Montana museums or something. I can't remember which one, mm -hmm. but it was, yeah, it was amazing. So, yeah. All right. Very good. All right. We'll talk soon. And uh, you bet. don't go on too many trips. Keep painting. Do what you want. Tell your wife to watch this. <laughs> I will. I will. When does this come out? Do you know? Pretty soon. Uh, it'll you be out in the, next, uh, in the next two months. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, thank we you, Mark. Have a, lot of, a lot of podcasts in the in the can right now, but it'll come out. Uh -huh. yeah, I'll let you know all that. And then you can market it somewhat, too. I will. You all bet right. I will. All right. All thank, right. Thank you so much. It's great seeing you. It's great seeing you, Mark. Thank you. All right. Take care.